Time. Welcome to our third Med Mentor session. Um, I'm trying to put in a tiny URL link for all of you to the agenda. So let me just do that really quickly here. Hopefully it works out. Um, so today we're going to be talking about a really important topic, which is about how to decide where you're going to apply and all the questions that might um, be associated with that process. We have seven amazing uh, med students here that are uh, going to answer any of your questions you might have and get their perspectives. Um, also, before I forget, uh, we do have a feedback form. So if you do need to uh, check out a little earlier, so um, please do provide feedback. We are making every, every effort to make these as informative and helpful for you guys as possible. So it should only take a couple of minutes and it really would help us to help you. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists. Maybe you guys could give a brief intro, maybe say something like your undergrad, where you went, um, something fun like your favorite song or favorite caffeine drink or something like that. I can go. <laughs> um, my name is Brittany. I am from Northern California. I went to Duke for undergrad um, and graduated in 2018. And let's see, my favorite caffeine drink is probably just a coffee. I'm a really a big fan of iced coffee. And I'm glad that in LA, it's like always iced coffee weather. So thanks for being here, guys. I can go. Hi, guys. I'm Nomie. I'm from Southern California, about an hour away from LA. I went to MIT for undergrad, graduated in 2019. And... I would say my favorite song of the quarantine right now is Level of Concern by 21 Pilots, just because they wrote it, recorded it, and released it all in the matter of the time that we've been in quarantine. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Anna. Um, you may have seen me in other Med Mentors panels. And I went to UC Berkeley for my undergrad, Go Bears. I'm from Southern California, and my favorite caffeine drink is also coffee. Big coffee gal. I have some right here. <laughs> my name is Jenny. Um, I'm from also from Northern California, and I went to San Diego for college. Um, I think in terms of favorite song, there's this duo called Oh Wonder and similarly they wrote a song called Lonely Star um, talking about like kind of quarantine and whatnot and I thought that was a really nice song. Hi so I'm Leilani and I also went to Berkeley Go Bears. Um, I'm from the Central Valley from Fresno so that's where I am right now and um, for coffee drinks. My sister loves making like coffee drinks and going to like bougie little coffee shops and apparently one of like the best ones is like actually in Visalia. So she like drove out over there which is like 45 minutes away from Fresno. Um, but of course like LA has all of like the fancy little coffee shops that y'all will get to enjoy <laughs> or already do. Hi my name is Emmanuel. Uh, I'm from NorCal originally but I went to UCSD for undergrad and masters uh, and I like Red Bull. Nice. Well, thank you guys for that. Um, most of you may know me from PV Sessions as well. I'm Ryan. I went to Berkeley as well. Um, and I guess favorite, I've recently been exposed to Dalgona, if that's how you pronounce it. So uh, I've made that a couple of times, probably too late in the night and regretted it later. Um, but anyway, uh, with that, we'll get started with today's panel. Um, so last time we used a, a sort of hybrid um, format that involved bouncing back and forth between slides and panelists. We're going to be doing that again today. I think most of you guys um, have provided feedback to us really like that format. So we'll do that. Um, we are going to try to spend more time on the panel parts of that and make it a little less rushed. So hopefully this all works out. So I'm going to share screens here really quickly. And... All right. OK, here we go. Um, so here's our session for today, and uh, the first question we're going to start out with is, you know, when should I start making a list of schools? And this is something that I think a lot of people ask, and uh, a lot of people get varied responses for. 
And um, at this point, we'll sort of go into my own perspective and then panelists, please uh, jump in and, and whatever. So I think you should start as early as you know that med school is something that you're interested in. So uh, really, it's sort of like when you're thinking about colleges, you're starting to look at things that um, maybe, like, are important factors for you and you get started very early on. So uh, if you already know that med school is sort of where you're headed or you have strong considerations that is going to be your future, then uh, definitely like I would get started as soon as possible. Uh, a couple of reasons for that is that schools will often list the requirements and some of them may be obvious and some of them not so obvious. Some of those requirements may be different. So I know when my um, application cycle was running, I ran into a problem where I found out that a couple schools had some course requirements that I had not really taken. So I had to contact them and ask if there were any like sort of circumstances that could be changed. Um, also, in terms of deadlines, even though AMCAS sort of sets some of their own deadlines, there are many that are school specific that uh, would be good to be aware of as early as possible. Um, it's also good to be familiar with sort of the admissions practices. Like, is this a, a rolling admissions process where the admissions committee will consider things on a sort of case by case basis if they come in? Or is it non rolling where they start to evaluate applications sort of after a, a specific set date? Um, and ultimately, like, the, the earlier you start, the earlier you can start to plan some of your prereq courses in terms of uh, your undergraduate education activities you might be interested in, getting your clinical exposure, and ultimately networking with. Um, people at those schools. Um, so at this point, I'll turn over to the panelists. Uh, for, th for this session, it's going to be really hard to dissociate all of the different topics and questions we have on our agenda, um, but it would be great if we could focus for the, the, this sort of short time period about sort of when did you start looking at schools um, and sort of what made you get into that. So I'll stop sharing and we can turn it over to you guys. Okay, well, I can get started and kind of pr provide my perspective. So I definitely agree with Ryan that you can start looking as soon as you want, even now, to especially make sure that you meet those requirements. But I do want to kind of ease some fears about having the perfect school list so far in advance, because you only need uh, one school on AMCAS to submit your primary application. You don't have to have your school list perfected. You can actually add schools um, at any time to your application. So if you're like not sure if you want to apply to a school or not, and um, it's kind of on this like maybe list and you just, you can't decide, it's totally fine. You can have like a core list of the ones that you know you want to apply to and you can submit your primary application to only those schools. And then you can add other schools later as you become more sure about them. You just want to do that before your application gets transmitted to schools so it's still transmitted as early as possible. Um, and that date for this cycle, just uh, to keep you all informed, MCAS opens on May 4th. So that's next week, very soon, very exciting. Um, if you follow us on Instagram and Facebook, we'll be posting reminders about all the dates and good tips and things. Um, at UCLA Med Mentors. And um, May 28th is the first day that you can actually submit AMCAS, and that's your primary application. That's just your personal statement, your work and activities, your biographical information. Um, and that's when you just have like your preliminary school list. And then you can add schools at any time after that. Um, really throughout the application cycle, but it's in your best interest to do it sooner rather than later before July 10th, because that's when it gets sent off. So hopefully that makes sense. The timeline can be really confusing um, and kind of convoluted. So chat us if you have more questions about that. But I agree, start as early as possible and end before July 10th of your application year, if it's this year. Yeah, I can add just a little bit. I obviously echo everything they said about starting early. I know personally what worked for me was making actually like a much bigger list than I actually planned to apply to, just so that I knew that all my bases would apply here, I'd have this many hours, or if I applied here, I'd need to take stats. And just, I felt like that helped kind of narrow down whether I even wanted to apply to a school that had certain requirements, or if like, 
I could change what was happening in undergrad to sort of fit those schools if I knew that was where I really wanted to go. So I think having like a much bigger list and then narrowing it down is also an option so that you don't really feel like you have to like honest I'd like have the perfect list right when you are ready but you have like all these options for you to choose from. Uh, yeah, Sophia, I think really quick. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. One moment. Um, I forgot to initiate the poll. So as Leilani goes for her response, um, we're going to put up a poll just to sort of see who you guys are in our attendee list. All right, go ahead, Leilani. Sorry. No, no worries at all. Um, okay, yeah. So I'm Leilani, and um, for for mine, I think I was thinking like, how do I even make a list? Like, I didn't have like anyone from my family or even like close friends that had gone to um, medical school. And so trying to see like how, like what, like how many medical schools are there even? So there's more than 175 medical schools in the country and um, 120 of those are MD programs. And, oh, let's see. Oh, there's a lot of seniors. Okay. And you've attended other sessions. Oh, a lot of you have attended other sessions. Okay. Um, and so there's like 120 MD programs and there's like 50 DO programs. So depending like what kind of, of um, doctor you want to be and so you can brainstorm um, some things like uh, off of the list that they have on the AAMC website um, by using MSAR the medical school admissions requirements site and so it costs $28 for a year of access um, it like and it will let you know like for each school like um, their overview their admissions the acceptance data uh, what they focus on in terms of their mission, because you want to make sure it's like a good fit for you, um, whether like they focus more on like research or like social things, things like that. Also, how much it costs, like their tuition, the aid um, that they give, and then I'll also give like averages for how much debt people have from that school, um, and then what like campus life is at, um, is like, and what the different um, data shows for like what like GPA and MCATs people had from that school, even though that those aren't like the only things um, that really matter in the whole application process. If you apply to, I hope everybody knows about the fee assistance program, but if you don't, um, you could just Google fee assistance program, AAMC. Um, if you are part of that program, if you're low income, then you get access to this resource um, for free. But if not with the $28, then you could go ahead and like get more data from that um, MSAR um, website. And then yeah, looking at some of that, what they were interested in, um, what I think was a good fit for me was helpful when I was trying to make a list. I agree with Leilani. I think like the MSAR is a really good resource, especially like if you don't really like know the different med schools because there's so many available to apply to. Um, so it helps narrow it down because there's like different fields that you can filter to. So like for example, if you know for sure that you want to stay in the city, I think there's an option for you to kind of like filter like if a school is more in a city urban environment or like a um, rural environment. Um, and you can kind of like start narrowing things of like narrowing down things that you're like interested in a medical school. Um, I, I, I just, go. oh, sorry, Manny, do you want to go or? Uh, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to clarify on the timeline too, because we got a, a question in the Q&A about that asking if applications submitted between that May 28th to July 10th um, are all forwarded at the same time? And the answer is no. So that's the benefit of applying as soon as you can to that May 28th date, because once you submit on that date, your application essentially enters this like queue to get verified personally by AMCAS, and they literally go through every single one of your classes. So that can take if you submit right at the beginning, it can just take a few days. If you submit kind of at the peak of when lots of people are submitting, it could take up to like four weeks or even longer. So you want to be closer to the front of that queue so that your application gets verified sooner and transmitted to schools earlier. Um, that being said, it won't be transmitted anytime, even if you're verified before July 10th. So usually a safe bet is to apply within the first two weeks and you'll probably be verified by July 10th. Um, and then if you submit after that and you're still in the queue, it may be like a little bit after July 10th, uh, but hopefully that clears that up a little bit. Keep sending questions in the Q&A about timeline. I know that's confusing if you're still, yeah, thinking that through. Uh, 
I was going to say too. Um, so when you're using MSR, I think MSR actually has a lot of details too about what people had done prior to being admitted to the school that they're interested in. So it can also kind of give you an interest. I don't know how, how much of a hard requirement it is, but it can kind of give you a better picture of like uh, people who went to this school did more research or people who went here uh, worked in industry for a year or two. So it can kind of give you like a, a snapshot of the, I guess the other dimensions of your application other than your score that might be useful for applying to a target school. So I think MSR is a really good resource. As you can see, it's really hard for us to dissociate sort of all these questions. Um, like the, the resources sort of tie into when do I start looking and what things do I use to factor my decisions and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of just to, to clarify on the, the time for looking at schools, I would say again, as many of our panelists have said, starting early is always a good bet, but you don't have to have that entire complete perfected list um, at any point in time. I think uh, if anyone has had that experience, um, we can probably speak to that, but I think most of us, we had our sort of first schools coming in and then during the application process, while our MCAS application was even being processed, we're still looking at schools deciding, oh, should I apply to this one? Should I apply to that one? Um, so th there is a lot of flexibility uh, in that time frame. Um, so unless we have any other uh, questions related to this topic, we'll sort of jump to our next one here. Um, we already had some discussion on resources that were available for sort of uh, refining, or, or first of all, creating a list, like where do you even start? Um, so I'm going to share screens with our PowerPoint here again, uh, and then we'll just cover a couple of things. Um, so in terms of what resources are out there for even starting to make a list, uh, some of them have already been mentioned. Um, I think Leilani mentioned that there's an MCAS list of participating schools. There are a lot of them out there, and it can be really difficult to sort of find all the individual websites and uh, like go about it that way. Um, so that's a really good summary resource for just sort of finding what those uh, look like. In terms of completeness though, be aware that MPAS is not universally, universally used. So there are some schools, uh, a number of them in Texas, who use uh, the Texas Medical and Dental Schools Application Service. And that's sort of a separate um, sort of beast to deal with. So just be aware of that uh, in case that's an area of interest for you. In terms of uh, resources that are specific to the schools themselves, uh, the School of Medicine websites are probably one of the best resources you can use. Um, usually there will be a prospective students tab and usually there will be an admissions tab and information located on those uh, can vary anywhere from FAQs to the stats that people come in with to uh, the emphasis that the school places on certain uh, like learning focuses, uh, etc. And usually they'll also have their specific requirements up there as well. So that's another reason to, to check those out. Uh, in terms of comparison resources, so um, I think people have mentioned MSAR a lot. That's a fantastic resource if um, that's your thing. Um, one of our actual uh, undergrads here at UCLA individually emailed me and uh, I want to give a shout out to, um, to her. And she provided an, a link to a mission statement compilation of the medical schools. This is from 2017. Uh, you'll find it in the, the last slide of this slide deck, which we will be releasing for you guys. Um, but if you want to use that as a comparison resource, you can sort of see what the schools place emphasis on through their mission statements. So those probably haven't changed since 2017 too much. Um, so if that's something that is a good first pass for you, you can always use that. Uh, and similar to MR, um, US News and World Report, they have a number of sort of ranking systems. I think there's a subscription associated with that as well. Um, but there are some additional pieces of information you can get there. Um, so. We'll go to our uh, panelists again here. So uh, maybe you could describe some of the resources that you used in terms of uh, starting to assemble your list. Um, I can talk a little bit about it. So I, I use MSAR like everyone else was talking about. Really great resource in terms of being able to compare and contrast where you want it to be. And also just like finding out about schools that you just don't know that exist that you might be interested in. I think one thing that I did that was not on the PowerPoint was just like going to a lot of like med pre-med fairs where schools would all come and basically have like pamphlets or different admissions reps come and just talk to you about them school as well as sometimes having students. And um, I'm me and Leilani are members of the Prime program and the only way I even found out about the Prime program was because of like 
a UC San Diego prime student who was at like a admissions fair in Boston and just like told me a lot about the program. So, and obviously it's like one of the best things that has happened to me. So I'm very, very happy about that. And I think that taking those opportunities to like talk to admissions reps, um, have them describe your school, describe the school, especially students, because like it's not that common that you get to talk to different medical students about their experience in the school can say a lot um, that sometimes the website doesn't say or doesn't say as uh, candidly. So I was the heavy website um, scour. I like would go through every single tab I could find. I would look at the FAQs. I would look at every bit of information that they had on their websites. Um, and I did use the mission statements as sort of a first pass because I found that some schools would place an emphasis on certain things. Um, so I was coming in as an MD PhD applicant and I really wanted to make sure that research was prioritized in those institutions. Um, but there are a number of other sort of emphasis points that many schools will um, put in those um, mission statements, some being sort of community uh, work, some being uh, helping with underrepresented um, communities, um, others being like a very significant outreach and like a global um, public health, that kind of stuff. Um, so you can sort of get uh, some ideas in terms of uh, really big uh, themes in the medical school just from looking at those websites. Yeah, to add on, I definitely use the websites a lot and I created my own sort of big Excel spreadsheet where I looked at um, a lot of things that are on MSAR, honestly, but so maybe their average GPA and MCAT, so statistics stuff, uh, the size of the city, um, mission statement, um, and then I looked into specific programs they had. For example, one thing I was interested in is, for example, um, research or working with education and pediatrics. So I would look and see if they had opportunities for med students to be involved in that sort of thing. Or maybe it's global health for you, or it's outreach clinic, whatever it may be. I think it's interesting to see what specific programs exist at those schools. And, and if you can imagine yourself getting involved with those programs and whether those resources are available. Um, I also definitely used AMSAR because it organized a lot of the, the mainly statistics that I wanted to know about. And um, it's a great place to find everything kind of collected and assembled there. But I agree that the websites are a really interesting way to see, for example, if they say that research is important to them or service is important to them on their website, um, sort of what evidence can you find or what involvements can you see sort of proof of that med students are involved in um, on their on their site. Yeah, I think something to, oh, sorry. We're going to no, something? no, you go, you go. <laughs> okay, um, I think something I looked at too was the past secondary prompts that each school had um, because some schools have like really long prompts about things that I found kind of obscure and then, then didn't really care about. So I wasn't going to like spend the initial time to put my primary there and then get like the secondaries um, that would, that I just kind of didn't want to do. And so the secondary prompts also give you an idea of like what parts do they focus on and what do they really care about? So it gives you a little bit more of an idea about the mission. Um, I think on average, like someone had asked on the chat, how many schools people apply to? I think for California students, it's about like 30. Um, and I think I, I, I yeah, I, I think I was at 29, um, but someone else can like other panelists on here. I think I was like 25, so I was right up there with you. Yeah. Wait, I don't think 30 is the average for Cal. I think the yes, national like average five. is 16. So just for reference. Oh, I maybe for, I think Berkeley said that theirs was like 30. Okay. I guess they called it like the California. Are neurotic, so <laughs> I'm not surprised, like but don't like 30 is a lot. I did 27. So I was also up there. Okay. But, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's a, yeah. like, tell me if anyone here did anything different, but I just want to give you like what it on average, like the neurotic yeah. people like us uh, do. Obviously people can do less and like, you'll be totally, or could be yeah. fine, but yeah. um, just like, but it's know what we do. expensive. And um, the fee assistance program that you mentioned, Leilani, I was looking it up. It covers 20 primary applications. Mm -hmm. um, so you would, yeah. So that's something to consider. And it covers, it covers your primary applications. And then also it covers 
um, the secondaries too, which is super cool because like those schools will say, will honor it. And they say like, okay, like if you had um, your primary covered, we'll honor it for your secondaries, except for like Tulane in Louisiana. Yeah. They were like, we know. Yeah. And so like they, their fee was like something ridiculous. Um, <laughs> They're not ridiculous, just something regular that I was like, oh, I don't have the money for. Um, I guess like if you have any like more like low income questions, like blah, blah, you could like message the chat, chat or like I'm sure that you get um, you get like more info after about like our um, like emails and stuff. So you can always reach out to me personally if you have questions about that. Yeah. And on that same note, it never hurts to just email a school and ask if they have any resources for low income applicants. If you just ask, like the worst thing they're going to say is no, the best thing that could happen, they could even like cover your interview costs and things like that. So it's always worth to ask if you really can't um, afford something and they may be able to help. And I agree with that, like throughout the process, like even if like, oh, you already sent in your app through AMCAS and you feel like, oh, they're not going to help you with my interview or they're not gonna help you with like second look or they're not gonna help you with something just like continue to ask because I was shocked by how many people like after the fact I was like could you pay for this they're like sure and I was like okay maybe I wasn't even as interested in you then but now I'm gonna go and see if I have a chance with this so always keep asking any other comments on resources to use things to uh, help in the process. Oh, um, so I'm seeing a question here. That's what what's the California effect. So I'll just address that sentence since I mentioned it. Um, I think it's that because schools in California are so competitive, people will apply like people from California generally like apply to more schools versus like, um, for example, I think when I was looking like at a school, let's just say like in Tennessee or something, I was like, oh, the admissions rate seems better because it's more like 20% instead of like UCLA is like 3% or whatever it is. Um, but then they say, actually, we have like a strong preference for our own in-state people. And so like for out of state, it's actually like 0 0.03 that they accept or something. Um, so that's why people, if they're from like um, these other states, sometimes they'll prefer their own in-state people um, and people from California. It's not like we have, um, California has like a better preference for us, even though like stats do show that there's a lot of people from like UC Berkeley and UCLA um, and like the Ivy Leagues like at, at UCLA um, more so than um, like state students, like California state schools. Yeah, and I think additionally, there's just way more pre-meds being created by the UC Cal State system. And like, because there's obviously in-state preference along like all of the United States, you just have more Californians applying to like the same like five to six UC medical schools, plus um, the other like Stanford, Loma Linda, the other ones that are in California. So compared to like University of Washington is the only med school for five different states in like the Northwest area. So it's just the numbers working out between how many California students, how many schools are in those states versus other ones. Yeah, we'll be getting into some of the, the numbers a little later in our session today as well. Um, I do want to take a moment to answer one of the questions that also came in about uh, the current sort of pandemic situation and if it's okay to apply without your MCAT score. Um, this is going to be something that is very school specific. So UCLA's medical school has released an official statement saying that it should not having an MCAT score should not delay your application process for them. So don't let that um, affect your timeline. Um, but I would also recommend that if you are applying this cycle and it is a concern for you, make sure to reach out to the schools that you are applying to. I've checked out some websites and some of them have not released like official statements that indicate one way or another. So it would be good to, to look for flexibility there and to determine sort of what each school's policy on that is. But definitely, I would say move forward with everything as if uh, as if everything was okay, um, and and really try to to get everything in as early as possible. Um, so I think we'll move on to our next question here. So uh, the next sort of topic that we're going to cover is uh, on the different factors that um, are going to be important for making your uh, sort of school fit list, if you will. Um, so there are a number of things that people take into account. So what are some of the ones that we've looked at? Um, I really wanna stress here that a lot of sort of being a medical student or a pre-medical student rather is like trying to make yourself fit for a school. Like you're trying to get a high GPA, you're trying to get a high MCAT, you're trying to perfect that personal statement, outline all the commitments and sort of activities that you've done that show that you're passionate about medicine. But something that I really, really want to hit home here is that it's equally important 
that the schools you're applying to be a fit for you. So it's like, don't be picking a school just because of a prestige factor alone or um, some other factor. Like it really should be something that is a mutual fit. And naturally, I mean, there will be some schools that um, may be considered a reach. Uh, there are some schools that are reaches for everyone, no matter what sort of your application looks like. Uh, but it really, you wanna make sure that your list is reflective of places that you yourself would envision yourself wanting to go and um, enjoy. Uh, so with that, uh, here's sort of a list of uh, potential factors that you might account. Um, some of them are sort of like college applications round two, looking at the program size. Uh, one thing that I found very uh, helpful for me was matriculant history, particularly in the diversity department. Um, I actually had uh, an admissions interviewer tell me straight to my face, like, you know, um, I just want to like let you know that uh, if you were to come here, it you, you might not have the sort of same environments or exposure that you're used to having gone to undergrad in California. And that was really helpful for me because um, it wasn't that um, that individual was pushing me away, but they were just trying to be extremely transparent and say like, if this is a factor that's very important to you, it should be something to take into account. Um, location and weather, obviously uh, those things can be uh, very high or very low on your radar. Uh, I had a, <laughs> one of my very good friends here, humidity was a very important factor for her. So. Uh, when it came down to the line, she had to pick between two schools and one was less humid than the other. And here she is at UCLA. Um, some of the medical school specifics, uh, we've touched on a number of these already, um, but mission statements can be very helpful for looking at sort of their focus. Um, curricula as well, some schools will advertise the structure of their curriculum and that can give you an idea of what the next several years are going to look like for you. Um, and many schools are undergoing curriculum changes, so that's also something that you would want to be aware of. Medical training facilities, some schools have very specialized facilities available for you, um, like simulation centers or uh, mannequins or very high tech things. Uh, so if that is an environment that you thrive in or want to see, that would also be something you could consider. Um, and last and certainly not least, uh, if you have interest in certain special programs um, that are dual degree or have certain focuses, uh, also take a look there. I think we have um, a couple of uh, prime students on our uh, panel here. Um, I'm an MD-PhD applicant as well. So if those are important, definitely check those out. And then naturally, there will also be some personal factors that no one else could, uh, could guess at. So that, that will take some, uh, some introspection. So I guess on the, the personal factors, uh, for our panelists, maybe could you describe some of the, the things that you took into account when you were looking at uh, whether a school was a good fit for you? Well, I can speak to this a little bit. So um, I know people have said this a lot, but it really, where can you see yourself for four years? Uh, you'll get a much better sense of where you think you might fit in when you actually go and visit the schools or do interviews at the places. But a lot of it has to be with, um, can I see myself here for four years? Does the curriculum kind of speak to me? Does this sound like something that I like to do? And then I think another really important thing that I'm not sure if it's becoming more popular, but it was something I definitely considered was the dual degree program. Um, if you are interested in a dual degree program, I think that certain universities like the UCs, for example, uh, offer dual degree programs to people who are interested in like public health or primary care. So kind of consider, um, where you want to be at and also if there's aspects more than the medical school itself for example like a volunteer opportunity or a uh, master's degree you'd like to pursue that would be available at the school you're looking at any other thoughts on factors uh, I know for me, I, I really was, the diversity thing actually really hit home for me. Um, the school was in the Midwest and I uh, really wanted to make sure that I was close to family um, and had uh, exposure to a lot of diversity in terms of the, the food that was available, the grocery markets. Um, uh, some of those factors can seem kind of small, but when you consider things in the grand scheme, it can, it can add up. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any other factors that came into your choice. Also, um, sorry, Leilani got bopped off um, from the Zoom because of Wi-Fi, unfortunately. Uh, but if you do have specific questions for her, feel free to, to ping us and we'll definitely put you in contact with her. Um, I just wanted to add kind of the um, 
importance of location. I know that it kind of seems trivial. It's like, oh, you can live four years anywhere, but I'm really afraid of snow. And I applied <laughs> in like a giant L shape of the US. So I didn't apply to any Northeast schools. And that's a totally okay factor to use, especially if you're coming down to the end and you're thinking that, um, you know, do I want to live in snow for four years? And I said, you know, probably not. And maybe you love snow um, and that's great, but it's okay to use factors like that to narrow down your list as well. I agree. And like for me personally, I really wanted an urban environment. So I kind of filtered looking at schools that are in urban environments. Um, some other things to think about are maybe like, is it near a teaching hospital? Um, how do people in that area get around? Do they usually use a bike? Do they walk? Do they use a car? I guess in the case of like Los Angeles, you can think about like how bad will traffic be and how would that affect my day-to-day -day, um, life and even like how it will affect my future education and trying to get to places um, and stuff like that. And someone just to add on to that like location kind of theme, uh, someone mentioned in the chat um, or in the Q&A about like considering residency programs. And it is kind of a like long way off when you're deciding where to go to med school, but it is an important factor because many uh, residency programs may give preference to the students from their school. And then also there tends to be a, some sort of regional preference, especially if you've been living in an area for a long time, um, you're more likely to attend a residency in that area and stay in that area after you finish your residency program. So that's something that certain programs may be looking for. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't make it a main factor, but it's definitely something to consider if you want to, say, stay in the New York City area. It may be a good idea to go to a school in the New York City area um, or close by so you can do away rotations there, you can make connections to the faculty there, maybe do research, all these kind of connections to further your application for residency. There's always another application, isn't there? <laughs> oh yeah, and then I forgot to mention, sometimes like the whole factor that Ryan was saying about if you have family um, in the area can also kind of like affect how schools may be seeing you because um, like they talk about a lot about like how if you have a stronger tie to the area, the school might be more will, like look at your application in a different way versus like if you don't really have any ties to that area, they're like, why are you applying here? Um, and then you would have to try to convince them in other ways. Yeah, location definitely did come up for me. Um, it more so came through the interview process than the application process itself. Um, but definitely that was on the radar for the mutual fit in terms of, you know, I would like to be in California. So I, most of the schools I applied to were in California. My family is all on the West Coast. So that uh, was a pretty significant factor as well. Um, so Leilani is actually trying to get back in. I think she's in our attendee list right now. So we're going to try to get her back onto a, the panel. But again, if not, and you have questions for her, we can. Um, I think building off the uh, importance of family, you'd also have to consider too that if you do go farther away, it will make it more of a hassle and more difficult for you to visit your family or see your family for the holidays or for breaks or something happens. So it's just something to keep in your mind that if you do move far away, um, you're, you're gonna have some difficulty seeing your family and it might not always be feasible for you to go back for the breaks and holidays. Yeah, I'm back in, thank you. Sorry y'all, my Wi-Fi just crashed. This um, transitions a little bit into the next question, so I'll save a bit of it. But um, when you're thinking about the schools that you apply to, it can sometimes be really difficult to tell from the website and from MSAR, MSAR and all the other resources exactly what a school is like. And I think it was Manny who said this, it really helps when you're there in person. Um, and that really doesn't happen until you're in the interview process, unfortunately. So when you're looking at websites, and online resources and trying to figure out if a school is a good match. I think it's it's important to to apply somewhere that you think it would be reasonable likely, reasonably likely that you would go to, but also be somewhat open-minded and make sure that your list is of a reasonable size, just because it's 
can be very competitive and difficult to know what's going to happen with your applications. And you may have two or three schools that you absolutely love, but I would recommend applying to more than those that just seem perfect from their website. So um, I would say it's sort of a balancing act because it's extremely expensive. You don't wanna to apply to a million schools, but um, we'll talk about it again in the next question, but a reasonable range of schools that you think you would be happy going to. Yeah, for time, we're gonna jump into that next uh, section here, actually. Um, so here we go. And there we go. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how many schools to apply to, and then once you sort of have that list, how do you sort of go about refining it and narrowing it down, deciding which ones. Um, so I will be having a disclaimer here. This is my personal view. It is not at all reflective of uh, what your um, perspectives also might be. So uh, panelists will definitely um, probably have some different perspectives here. Um, but uh, to give you some data, the last cycle, there was an average, if you take the total number of applications that were sent out and the total number of applicants, it came to about 16 or 17 applications per person. Now that is a flawed data point um, because like some people in that list probably applied to like 60 schools and some people maybe only applied to four. Um, but on average, that is sort of where people are uh, uh, applying. So in terms of trying to find the number, uh, the question of how many schools to apply to and which ones, those are sort of two connected questions. So this slide is focusing on the number. Um, you really want to take into account costs. So it, it is an expensive process. The fees sort of ramp up very quickly. And uh, depending on the schools themselves, they may have associated fees for their secondary applications. Um, the interview process can add to that as well. So uh, that's something definitely to consider if you're looking at a large list of schools, um, in terms of your budget there. Uh, and like a number of people have mentioned, the fee assistance program is a really useful resource to help sort of defray some of those expenses. Um, in terms of safeties, fits, and reaches, this is kind of like the, the idea in college applications. Um, you wanna make sure you're applying broadly, so your list should include schools that fall into each of those categories. Um, ideally, if you find that your list is sort of falling very uh, sort of heavily weighted to the reaches side, then you might want to consider balancing that out um, because, again, the, the competitiveness of these schools can be very daunting and make it a very challenging thing to do. Um, so what I've done here is I've created a really crude sort of drawing about my view on how it works in terms of there being filters. So your MCAS application or primary is one filter. Your secondary is another filter and the interview is the third filter. Um, and there's a certain sort of heuristic that you could use associated with whether a school will um, sort of let you go from one filter to the next based on, uh, you can use acceptance rates to sort of do a heuristic analysis for that. Or um, for me, I came up with really dumb ballpark numbers like, oh, if it's a, a good fit of a school, maybe I have like a one in four chance or something. Um, just, just to give myself at least a number because I'm a very numbers oriented person. Um, and then on the bottom here, my personal bias, I think uh, you should probably shoot for at least 15 applications would be my personal recommendation. Um, but I'm sure our panelists will have some, um, some thoughts there. In terms of narrowing down your list, there are a number of things you can do to make that happen. Uh, qualitatively, people have uh, mentioned a number of these already. Uh, really useful to attend the, like tours or campus uh, visits and get a sense of sort of in person what it's like. Um, you can also reach out to students and people at those institutions. Um, you can also read online forums, but I say that very hesitantly because things like SDN or Student Doctrine Network like, can be very toxic at times. So be careful about <laughs> where you venture on the, the interweb for this um, perspectives. Quantitatively, I think uh, some other people may have done this as well, but I made like a massive spreadsheet in terms of uh, factors and I weighted those factors. Um, so it's probably hard to see, but I like organized by state, um, the program type, uh, application deadlines, location, et cetera, and then I gave weightings to those. And that helped me when I sort of like couldn't decide between a couple of schools, it helped me sort of objectify that decision process. And ultimately I found out that I had some biases through that process and that was able to, for me, determine what was most important. Um, so we'll go to our panelists now and if you could maybe describe sort of if you're comfortable how many schools did you apply to and uh, sort of how did you go about narrowing down your list? I can go. Sorry, okay, unmuted. Um, I think similar to what Leilani said, I think I applied to like 20, 
five to 28 schools. I think I like applied to some and then like would panic throughout the process and keep adding schools. So, um, which is a way you could do it. But I also suggest like if you have a school list, trust in that and just like let it be. Um, just to echo a lot of other people said is like location. And like within that, it's not just like, where would you be happiest, but also like, where would you like absolutely not hate it? You know, like there's definitely some schools where it's like, I knew I wanted to be in California, but let's say I applied to school in Arizona, like I could, I could go to Arizona and be happy and be a good distance away from my family. Whereas I knew like I was not going to live in Ohio. And so a school would like never make the list. So I think just being completely honest about like, would you actually go there? Because it will manifest in how you approach that application, like how well you write those secondaries. And let's say you got an interview, like how much enthusiasm they see that you have for that school. So it's like, don't waste your time if you absolutely know you're not going to like be happy there for whatever, whatever reason that's going to be. Like I have terrible memories of being a child in Ohio and that has nothing to do with that med school, but I knew I wouldn't want to go there. Um, and then in terms of looking at GPA and MCAT, um, I think a lot of the time people try to look at them together, like you want both your GPA and your MCAT to like both be above a certain percentile. And I think that's really hard because some people have those high stats. I know personally I didn't and like my MCAT was higher than like maybe where my GPA would reflect. So sometimes I did have to like look at schools and be like, would my MCAT get me in here? knowing that maybe my GPA wouldn't, but like still not letting that deter me from putting it on the list if that school was really a school I wanted to go to. And I think the reason I ended up having like more than 15 is like, I ended up having maybe more reaches than I wanted to apply to and then had to add safeties to like make up for that. But I really caution between like safety and reaches and fits as a, as a thing that works with your GPA and MCAT because it's super hard. I think some of the schools that I thought for sure I was a shoe in to like either get an interview at at least like didn't talk to me and didn't hear anything back and in schools I was like wow I never would have guessed I would hear back from like I did and then I would get into so I think it's really hard to sit there and like run the numbers and try to game the system of like this is a place I for sure could get into and this is a place I couldn't when like a lot of it is chance so just like having like pools of schools that fit in those reaches and fit in those safeties is really important so that you know from this pool there's a good chance but like to bang everything on one of those schools within those pools is just it's just really really hard um you just like never know and yeah those are some of the things and then obviously money is a factor and goal degree as well i think those are more specific to yeah i just want to show my agreement with nonia on like like it's such a big like chance factor in all of this and I never would have imagined I would get into UCLA, but here I am. And so you just like, you never really know, but then again, you want to play a little bit safe and not apply to all places that you don't think you would get into. So that's kind of where it comes down to when you're making your list, trying to divide it up into like, I think one rule of thumb is like 75% of your school list should be schools where you are at their stats or above their stats and then 25% should be um, schools that you're below their stats but you would really like love to go there and feel you're a really good fit um, and then you kind of are in that hopefully Goldilocks zone of like shooting your shot but also being safe because it is there's so much chance involved and even if you're like a perfect applicant with super high stats you may not get into like these highly ranked schools and there's nothing that you know you can really predict that will say for sure you'll get in somewhere or not so just wanted to agree with that now this is just to echo a bit of what we talked about in the previous med mentors and what um classmates have said today but schools look at your holistic application. I know that's a buzzword, but really your MCAT and GPA and those numbers are, are one piece of the puzzle of your application and elements. So it's, it's hard and to look at those numbers and see schools that have these average ranges. And sometimes the, they're not predictive is uh, what I'm trying to say about what, what schools you may or may not get into. So, um, 
as my classmates have covered already, it's smart to really apply to a range of schools and think about sort of the general fit of the school and all the different factors as much as you can research about what the school cares about and what you care about and um, see what place would be would be a good overall fit for you. And these schools often, they're trying to fill a class and you don't know the other people who apply for this class. And there's a lot of other factors, as Anna said, that are very much chance and really out of your control. And so I would say put together your very best application as much as you can do and try to apply to schools that you think are, are a good fit and then sort of see what happens from there because so much is out of your hands and that's just that's just the sort of scary way of the math application world any other thoughts on how many schools you applied to and going about sort of narrowing down the list um i, I guess for perspective so i applied to 14 schools which i think was on the lower end of things um, and looking back on it, sort of a, a heuristic that I would use is that based on, I, I think I got secondary sort of requests for all of those schools and then probably got like uh, a 0.5 factor in terms of interview offers. So seven interview offers and then sort of a 0.5 factor on top of that in terms of sort of acceptances. So I was sort of deciding between only a couple schools when it came down to acceptances. So that might be a sort of advocating factor for bumping your end up a little bit higher um, but again sort of like what people have been saying that your application is much more than just the MCAT and GPA those can help in sort of setting a good starting point to, to look at things but um, there's a lot more to it than that yeah I, I agree with everything everyone said and on, on top of that Berkeley used to give us like this um, like the stats of how many people applied to like which schools and then like got in and then like how many, like which schools had like the highest number of like Berkeley grads. So I think UCLA has like a similar um, sort of like info sheet for you all um, with a lot of like different links on how to do different things. So I think that will be shared um, in the chat. All right, any other thoughts on this topic here from you guys? Uh, I would say shoot your shot. <laughs> if there's a school that you really want to try for and you know, the application process is pretty heavy and tedious and you know, I didn't want to go through it twice. So if there's something that you want to go for, if it might be a reach and then you have a compelling story, go for it. Don't have any regrets. Yeah, honestly, I think the story is the most powerful thing that you can provide to an admissions committee. Um, your stats are only part of that story, and in fact, a small part, if you ask me. Um, your essays and your extracurriculars, and if you're going for an interview or having secondaries that allow you to express more topics or interests of you, like those are your opportunities really to let yourself shine and come through. So um, like, like Emmanuel was saying, like definitely shoot your shot. Um, whatever schools are really interesting to you. If you like, you can't go to sleep at night because you're like, oh man, I wish I could go there. Like, do it, why not? Um, yeah, uh, so I think if we don't have any other topics from panelists here, what we'll do is we'll port over to sort of some of the Q and A's that we've been filtering in our discussion. Uh, Brittany, was there anything that uh, came up that we want to cover here? We're good. We're good, okay. Um, so I guess uh, actually sort of abnormal for some of our sessions here We're ending a couple minutes early, but um, if you guys do have questions coming in, we'll stick around for a little bit to answer them in uh, the Q&A. Um, I'll take some moments to answer actually some of the ones that are coming on just live here. Um, we have had some questions asking about stats from UCLA students and if people are comfortable sharing. We did have a discussion on this in our second Med Mentors Monday, so that was last week or two weeks ago. Um, look for the recording and whatnot, um, but to give you an idea, the range of GPA for UCLA med students that we polled was um, 3.5 to 4.0, and the range for MCAT scores was 508 to 526. So again, you don't need to be at the 4.0, 528 scores in order to um, um, do well. I wasn't. <laughs> Me neither. Um, let's see. Um, I guess we have some questions coming in also about looking, oh, we had actually some about secondaries and um, is it 
as we're as we're sort of formulating our application right now, is it a good idea to try to pre-write or predict what secondaries would be? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Like, wait, sorry, I was, I didn't hear the question. Um, should you pre-write secondaries? Is that the question? Uh, sort of, yeah. Like, is it a good idea to do that? Uh, is it yes. <laughs> yes, it's a good idea to do that. <laughs> the prompts are really easy to find online, and they usually don't change year to year. Um, and then you'll be able to submit your secondary essays early. So go for it if you have time. Thank or if you don't, it. you should still do it. <laughs> Sometimes Definitely like, something that I would, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Jenny. I'm oh, sorry. I think like sometimes it can be kind of tiring to like do a secondary immediately after doing the primary. Um, so like if you do want to just like focus on like a few key secondary questions, then like one that comes up really often is um, what's the challenge that you've gone through and how you've navigated it. Um, I think another is how would you convert, other not convert, um, con contribute to like diversity and whatnot so I think like there are like one or two key like uh, secondary questions that a lot of schools ask so if you just want to focus on those right now and then take a break for the rest that's also cool too yeah I just wanted to add I think it's definitely smart if you have sort of the mental energy left after primaries to just start thinking about and looking at most of the secondaries that are available online and often don't change. And even if they do change a bit, probably another school will ask practically the same question. And so just getting those thoughts going, um, it'll also help you for interviews. Personally, after primaries, I was very mentally tired. So I took like a two week complete break and read a bunch of books, which was fantastic. But then when I got secondaries, I had to write a bunch really quickly. And in that period, I was like, oh, it would have been nice if I'd pre written or pre thought about some of these. And so I think what Jenny was saying is really smart to like pick some key themes that are definitely going to come up um, and think about what you would say about those and uh, or some secondaries are notoriously long. So there are a few schools that I would say, I think UCLA is one, San Diego is quite long, Vanderbilt, Duke, Duke um, quite long. And so I would say take a look and preview those um, and sort of start thinking because it can be a lot to write a lot of secondaries very quickly um, when you need to. Yeah, I think like knowing yourself too, like I'm definitely more of like a pre-thinker person and not actually writing it down and getting stuff on paper till like it actually came because I kind of also like the thrill of being under the time crunch um, and think that it got me to like get my more creative juices flowing. So it depends like how you think you're um, going to work to like, knowing yourself. But if you don't find yourself pre-writing and you're like, oh, other people are pre-writing. Um, I mean, I wasn't like, I, I kind of was like, oh, it was a lot with the first primary go around so then I kind of just waited um, but then I was thinking in the back of my mind so if you can't have it on the back of your mind could be good um, but if you're able to have the energy to keep pre-writing and that's your more creative thought process then definitely go for it also if you need someone to review your personal statement and or secondaries there are UCLA med students who are happy to help um, go follow us on Facebook we've posted the link to the form to fill out there but um, it'll match you. It's first come first serve basis and they'll match you with the UCLA med student who will read through your essays for you for free. So go ahead and take advantage. Also the Career Center does that. So, um, so many resources take advantage of those. And then I also wanted to say too, the uh, question kind of popped up about um, how do you answer the why us school? I think that really does factor into the location thing that we were talking about earlier. And I think a large part of the cell or when you're describing whether you want to go to a school or not, is something you can say uniquely about that school. I think some schools can kind of tell whether you're being very honest and specific about the fact why you want to go to their school. And so I think it's important to factor in in your consideration of going to a particular school, how you could also use that as why you want to go to that school and also help you with your secondary. And for those things, do your research. I think like it's it really will come across if you're sort of trying to BS uh, the admissions committee. They, they've been through the gamut. They know every trick in the book. They, I think the worst thing I've ever seen was someone who's writing an essay and they just like copy pasted the entire thing into each 
thing, and then they would try to replace the school name, but they forgot to do so. So I think Yale got uh, an essay saying how much they really, really wanted to go into Harvard. So uh, just sort of <laughs> be careful with the whole process. Dot your I's, cross your T's, and, uh, and do your homework. Uh, have a friend yeah, look at it. <laughs> have a yeah. friend double check before yeah. you press send. Definitely, definitely. Um, so what we'll do now is we're sort of reaching the end here in terms of time. We don't want to keep you guys longer than we've sort of allotted. Um, we do have a number of things in our Q&A here. So if you have asked the Q&A, um, please do stay online. We're going to mute, turn our videos off, but we'll take care of the Q&As. But at this point, that sort of concludes our session today. Uh, thank you so much for attending. We really hope it was informative for you. And again, a quick plug on your way out. Please, 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 pretty please with an eye. Uh, cherry on top or whatever you like uh, like please fill out our feedback form um, we're like really really working hard to make these as useful as possible we've already made some changes based off of the uh, comments we've gotten before so it would be really helpful yes fill out the feedback form go do it right now really quick thank you and follow us on social media Instagram yes. and Facebook are <laughs> up and running <laughs> I have some gone. great Instagram posts coming so <laughs> <laughs> All right, so stick around if you guys have Q&As, uh, but otherwise, thank you guys for attending, and we'll catch you next time. All right? Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you. Stay healthy.